And we're back. And today we're going to be taking a little bit of a look at an old game called Stalker that I really enjoyed. Now this game is a, a bit of a hit and miss game for a lot of people I think, but for me there was this one moment that sort of defined this game and turned it from being just a generic shooter for me anyway into like a great game that I lost many, many, many hours to. I thought we'd just, well, I'd share that today. I mean, it's Christmas. It's the time for sharing happy stuff. For those of you who don't know what Stalker is, let's just have a, a quick brief rundown of what this game's about. Basically, it's a first-person shooter with a semi-open world. And by semi-open world, I mean, while the maps are reasonably large, especially for the time, this game was released in 2007. These, uh, these maps are connected together by points here to here type of thing, and then you move between maps. So it's semi-open world. But then again, even later games still had load times between areas. So the maps are not quite expansive, but they are pretty large. It's going to take you a while to get from one side to the other. And this sometimes is described as survival, however, I wouldn't call it survival. If you have to eat food occasionally, that's not survival, especially when food is so common and you need to eat so infrequently. The guts of the storyline is... You're a stalker, someone who's snuck into the zone. Now the zone is, uh, you know, let's just say it's a magical mystical place where lots of weird things have happened and it's around Chernobyl, so the magical mystical things have distorted the fabric of reality while at the same time there's a bunch of horrible mutants that all want to kill you. Now the military have set up a cordon around the place and you have snuck in. Why, in God's name, would anyone want to sneak into a heavily irradiated place full of dangerous mutants like, oh, say that weird boar looking thing over there that wants to try and eat you? Oh man, the way that thing walks is just not natural. Is that got a sore leg? Oh, never mind. Pretty detailed game. But it turns out all of these horrible anomalies that are about the place, let's go find one of those actually. So, do you see that creature over there? Well, it's running towards an anomaly and, oh. Just think about it, man. Next yeah. Time it could be you in this place. And. Yay. Yeah, that's one of the nicer ones. The whole reason people come to this godforsaken hellhole is these things. This is an artifact. These things are spawned by the anomalies. And they have some weird mystical properties. Stuff that's not, uh, let's just say it defies the laws of physics a wee bit. This one here gives you bullet resistance. Uh, this one here allows you to resist radiation, and this one here allows you to resist impact. So, yeah, basically nice bonuses that can help you out, though some of them are absolutely terrible. But we're not here to uh, critique that. What's the storyline then? Well, who cares? That's not what you're here for. What you're here for is you're a stalker. You're here to come in, raid the place, take everything you could loot, and make a bunch of money so that you can buy better weapons and equipment to do even more looting. That's sort of the gameplay loop you get caught up in. Now, what was that moment that made me love the game? Well, I was getting toted up to go shopping. I had a, a journey to make. I was going to be heading all the way over to the Dark Valley. I was over here, I was going to have to go on a long journey. And there's no fast travel in this game, which is painful. But you can sprint. That uh, blue bar down in the bottom left hand corner of the screen. The problem with that uh, sprint function is you can see the stamina is going down. And once the stamina goes down, and we're not even close to the edge of the map yet, once that's gone, you stop sprinting little bit of an annoyance. That means it's going to be really slow to get anywhere. However, there's a few other mechanics I should probably cover. One, you have a weight, a carry capacity. As in, you can carry 50 kilos of stuff. If you go above that, you can still keep moving, but your stamina will constantly go down. And if you go up above 60 kilos, you're immobilized because you can't carry more than 60 kilos. Which, you know, that's, that's pretty fair. If I was carrying around 40 kilos, I'd be a little bit slow as well. And 60? Not a chance. But not only that, what you realize pretty quickly is the more weight you're carrying, the faster your stamina goes down. So if we were to say put on, oh, I don't know, 50 kilos of weight or, well, 49.6 kilos of weight, then when we start sprinting, our stamina goes down faster and we can't make it as far across the map before we have to stop. So I started thinking, wait a minute, what if I could re reduce the amount of weight in my loadout? How much further could I sprint before I ran out of stamina? Of course, you then have to decide what's in your loadout and why. For one thing, we used to carry around a shotgun for taking care of soft targets like dogs. Turns out though, you know what works really well on dogs as well? Assault rifle bullets. Turns out it's just as good, but the reason we were carrying around this was because, oh, we thought it was more cost efficient to use shotguns. So get rid of the shotgun and get rid of the shotgun ammo. Suddenly we freed up a whole bunch of weight. Then, well, we'd been carrying around all of these med packs. You know what? We, we don't need these. We never needed more than about five. Uh, oh, vodka. We used to carry the vodka around because this thing would actually help you get rid of radiation poisoning. A little bit. It wasn't as good as the anti-rad medication, but it was really cheap, so I used to carry one around. That's half a kilo in weight. What was I thinking? I never used the grenades. They can go too. 
In fact, I never use the pistol. Anytime you get a weapons jam, you just hit the reload button and the gun reloads. I mean, it's just muscle memory at this point. I never actually use the pistol. And even if you did switch to the pistol, then you've got a, a weak gun with very few rounds of ammunition in it. And you're better off just reloading your jammed weapon. So no, that can go too. In fact, let's do a little... Oh, and also the ammo for it can go as well. After an, an actual good think, I managed to reduce my loadout to about 21 and a half to 22 kilos. And this became a defining moment in the game for me. Though at the time it was a nice little moment, but it wasn't until later that I realized just how defining this was. Because there's no fast travel in this game, sprinting is very important. As well as that, everywhere you go, you eventually have to come back and, uh, well, bring your loot back with you. So the more space you keep, the more you can bring back. This just meant I could get further, bring back more loot, and just be better at everything. And this changed the entire game. It just, it's, it's really hard to explain just how, it, it, how much it changed the entire game. This is the SVD M2 sniper rifle. This is the best sniper rifle in the game. It has excellent damage, almost zero bullet drop, and it just murders stuff. Also massive damage, even if you hit him in the chest. This is the Vintar BC. It's sort of like a hybrid between a sniper rifle and an assault rifle. Unfortunately, it handles a bit like a crossbow when it comes to shooting stuff. Yeah, I think we hit that guy in the arm. Yeah, we, we hit him again in the arm. Uh, yeah, again in the air. As you can see, not exactly the most exceptional sniper rifle in the world. Which one do you think people carry around most? If you said the sniper, you'd probably be wrong. Problem is, while this gun is weaker and not as effective, once you get used to it, you can't take out the targets. Not only that, this thing weighs in at a 3.41 kilos fully loaded, as opposed to the 5.13 kilos of the SVD M2. You don't just start looking at weapons anymore for their damage and stats. You start looking to see how much those guns weigh, how much the ammo for those guns weighs. Can they support under and over grenade launchers? Because under and over grenade launchers weigh 0.08 kilos and do as much damage as a full-size grenade, which weighs half a kilo. Hmm, things start getting interesting when you have to consider the pros and cons of a weapon and armor and the weights that go with it. So one of the reasons the Vintar BC became, well, well, one of my favorite loadouts, this weapon comes with a decent scope, can be used as a sniper rifle, extant at medium range, it has a 10 round mag, and at the same point, there is actually a reasonable amount of ammo for it floating around out there, so if you do find some out there, you can use it. Whereas the sniper rifle, the ammo was much rarer, meaning you're going to have to carry that ammo around from the start, meaning you're going to have to put like 100 rounds of ammunition before you even start out, whereas I can chuck in about 50 of the much lighter Vinter BC ammo, and off you go. This carry weight obsession starts getting really out of hand after a while. And the thing is, it reinforces the whole idea of the game. You're a stalker. You come in, you steal stuff, you get out. You travel light, you travel fast. This whole thing is reinforced by the game mechanics. For example, here's, a, here's the exoskeleton. This thing has a bulletproof cap of 60, as in bullet resistance of 60%. This is the best of all the bullet resistances you can get. And as well as that, it increases your carry capacity from a max of 50 to 70, meaning that's an extra 20 kilos of carry capacity on top of what you had before. This is, this is incredible. Like, this should be the best armor in the game. Unfortunately, it removes your ability to sprint, meaning you can only ever move at this speed forever and ever and ever. So there's no sprint ability anymore. Also, you get Night Vision Mark 1, which is um, not great. I'm not going to lie about that one. That, that's pretty weak sauce. So there's no way I am running around a map with no fast travel using armor that makes me crawl. Uh, also, as well as that, what's the weight on this thing again? Yeah, 15 kilos. So the 20 extra kilos of carry weight you get, it's actually more like an extra 5 plus whatever you don't have to pay for the armor. Next up, for Bulletproof Prehap, we've got 55% on the military armored suit, which weighs in at 12 kilos, which is a fair chunk. That's, that's going to weigh you down a little bit. As well as that, it is not the best when it comes to the other protections. The only thing you really care about is bulletproof cap, explosion, and rupture. Uh, explosion is grenades, and rupture is people trying to claw you to death. They're the most common forms of death, but lead poisoning is usually the most. Now, this one's actually quite a good choice. The problem is it, it costs 200 grand. And uh, I'll demonstrate this with this suit here. This one here, we're just going to cut this in briefly. This one has a bulletproof cap of 40%, and you'll notice that it's a, a fully, uh, fully unworn suit. And we'll put in this one here, which actually has some wear and tear on it, and you'll notice that the bulletproof cap has gone down to 36%. That means that as your armor gets damaged, it becomes less effective at stopping more damage, and after a while, you're going to have to replace it. This makes things difficult. Let's have a look at just, just one more here. The SSP-99M suit. 
This one here is the best in fashion wear, making you look lime green, but coming in with a bulletproof cap of 40. Outside of the, the two shoots of suits I've shown you before, this is the highest you get. All of the suits below that, the highest you can get is 40. This one is amazing though, because it comes in at seven kilos and has amazing chemical electrical burn. It, it's got actually some of the best resistances for all the anomalies of any suit in the game. And it weighs in at seven kilos. But what you normally end up, well, my preferred one for running around in is the SEVA suit, which comes in at nine kilos. This one also has a bulletproof cap of 40, but I can pick one up for about 20 grand from the scientists, meaning it's a cost-efficient suit that I can replace when I need to without having to spend an arm and a leg. I can still sprint, and it's got about a 9 kilo carry capacity. The thing is, not everyone prefers this suit. Well, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more later, but this choice also gives you access to Night Vision Mark II, which I, I kind of like as well. This obsession with having a very minimalist loadout led to some interesting inventions and improvisations. For example, you can loot enemies and take their stuff, but it turns out you can also put stuff in their inventory. That is, is not too bad, but what is bad is it turns out you can drag corpses around. There was an intention to make this, uh, well, to put in stealth mechanics, they never got around to fully implementing them, but this resulted in an interesting invention. The corpse suitcase. Grab a corpse, jam it full of all of the loot from the surrounding area, and then drag that corpse back to a shopkeeper. Then unload the, cor the suitcase, and there you go, you've got managed to take back what should have taken multiple trips. In fact, most of it would have despawned, or it would just not be worth it. Some of these weapons, like for the weight, like four kilos, you're only going to get a few hundred for that, so it's usually not worth it. But if you can take all of them in one run, hell yeah. However, there's, well, like all good things, there is problems. For example, this here is the edge of the map. If we try and walk across it dragging a corpse, it will make us drop the corpse. So we had to come up with our own innovative ways of getting around. Now this might take me a minute. Let's line up right about there. What happened there was a little bit fast, but we jumped over the corpse, hit F to access its inventory, and then immediately clicked on the take all button in the split second we had before we hit the edge of the map. So in midair, we picked up like 300 kilos worth of weapons and ammo and all sorts of stuff. And now, we get to move to the other map carrying all of that. Now, yes, our ankles should turn to glass or just shatter into a million pieces the moment we get to the other side and we're too heavily loaded to continue and we'll have to do this thing where we drop literally everything on the ground. That is the pile of resulting junk that we had to drop on the ground so we could eventually move again. Of course, this, this leaves us in a horrible position. What do we do? Well, if you have a look over there, you can see there's uh, one suitcase walking around and actually there's another couple of suitcases around here somewhere. So you just go grab a new suitcase and stuff all of that in them. In fact, they'll drop some more items for the fresh suitcase. This game is just so wonderful at some of the things it, can, it brought up. The explanation of those game mechanics was important because it gets across the point that this game is played as a stalker. And as a stalker, all the gameplay mechanics, the storyline, the atmosphere, Everything about this reinforces that feel, down to the carry weight and having to meticulously pick out how much you're bringing with you just to increase your chances of survival and what items are important. Hell, even whenever you pick up a new armor, gun, anything like that, you're not just looking at its stats, you're also looking at its carry weight to determine how that will change your loadout. And all of those combined give just a coherent message that sucks you into the world. And I think that's what made Stalker special, well, at least for me. For me, yeah, there was, there was some nice mutants, yeah, there was some fun scenes in it, but the whole package was what really made this game for me. And I think, uh, I, I don't think everyone got sucked in or some people missed bits here and there or didn't get the whole thing. But I think if it clicked for you, when Stalker clicked for someone, it really clicked. I think there's, there's still a whole bunch of addicts out there to this day. One other amazing part about the zone was there was no best loadout. Hell, you can look at the guns in this game. This here is the worst of the NATO guns. And uh, there's several of them, but this one is, is definitely the worst of the lot. It comes with an integrated scope, but, you know, very little zoom on there, as well as that its damage is quite low, and it can't mount a grenade launcher. You can't stick an under and over grenade launcher on that sucker. That one is the first you'll encounter, and the worst. The secondary one you will encounter comes with a, just, you know, your normal iron sights. It's actually a pretty good all-round gun. You can mount a scope on it, and you can stick it under an over grenade launcher on this sucker to give yourself a nice, effective, all-around weapon. However, then you've got the SIG. Now, 
one thing, we're going to dismount the scope and dismount the grenade launcher. And you'll see, you can't put a scope on this new one, but you can put it under over grenade launcher. As well as that, this one does better damage than the previous two weapons, but you're stuck with iron sights only. But you do get the under and over grenade launcher, which you can just start using at any time. And trust me, under and over grenade launchers are a hell of a lot of fun. Oops, I mean, sorry. Then, last but definitely not least, we're going to get ourselves the G36, or is it 38, whatever. This one comes with an excellent scope, but you can't mount an under and over grenade launcher on it. And this one's damage is equal to the SIG. So basically the SIG and the G, oh sorry, GP37, both have the same amount of bullet damage, but one comes with a scope and no grenade launcher, one comes with a grenade launcher and no scope. Then you've got the TR-300 TR there. This one can mount both the scope and the under and over grenade launcher, but its damage is actually slightly worse than the other two. So it really depends. How much do you want that grenade launcher, or how much do you want the scope? Or is the damage of the bullets the most important? Honestly, I was a, a scrub who ended up using the under and over grenade launcher and the scope on this sucker because, yes, yeah, some enemies I just prefer to have the grenade launcher. You see, that sucker right there is really nasty. And what I like to do is do this. A couple of those make an absolute mess of it. If you don't have the grenade launcher, well, you're going to be mag jumping. Oh my god, you're going to be mag jumping so much into one of these things. Just personally, yeah, I, I prefer the grenade launcher. One great thing about the under and over grenade launcher is it can be used to cure asthma. As you can hear, there's someone with asthma right behind us. And now they're cured. No more asthma breathing noises. Though, uh, we did get caught a bit in the, uh, the blast radius of that one. But yes, this is much better than running around shooting blindly at those damn things. God, I hate them so much. So does this beautiful old game, just absolutely chock full of ludonarrative harmony, stand up to the today's modern gaming landscape? Uh, the answer is, well, kind of yes and no. Uh, the no comes from the starting zone. This is your starting area, and here you'll be hanging out using pistols, sawn-off shotguns, low-end armor, and pretty much junk for the first few hours of your gameplay, and probably doing a few of the missions around here. And it is slow, and it is not very fast-paced. You have to remember, this game was made back in, well, 2007, when, you know, there was a different gaming landscape. Nowadays, nowadays you expect more action as your starting gameplay. However, linked in the description is a save game file. The save game file will give you this particular save where we got our hands on this Thunder 5.45. This is sort of a, one of those little secrets in the game. You can buy this off the starting trader and it is an incredibly good gun. Uh, this gun takes regular Rush, basic Russian ammo and does just enormous amounts of damage with it. Not bad. Stalker is a beautifully atmospheric game and I'm... I'm not sure they could ever replicate this. It was a product of its time. No fast travel, uh, the sprint mechanics, everything integrated to make this is what it is. It's uh, impossible to describe. You can only really experience the zone for yourself. If you do go and have a play around with it, do be a little bit forgiving. It is an old game. Also, it was put together seemingly with pretty much vodka and some sort of black magic because this game engine is so weird. Some of the things that happen are still a little bit odd to this day. This game pretty much sold me on the next two in the series, even though I don't think they ever quite lived up to the original. This original can never really go back to the zone a second time with fresh eyes. I know they also have a, a, a sequel or whatever coming out by some other games company that did something else and hey, are you are you eating that guy? Ah, the zone. Reminds me a bit of RimWorld actually. Anyway, I'm going to cut this out here. I hope you have a wonderful Christmas. I'll probably be a little bit sporadic with the videos over the Christmas season, but uh, enjoy your Christmas and good luck.